Okay, uh, good evening uh, or welcome everyone to episode 98 of Podchat Live. We're recording this Thursday the 20th of January 2022 um, and the topic of discussion is uh, getting yourself published in a journal, so submitting some work to an academic journal and, and seeing it then in black and white with, with your name on it. And um, when Craig and I decided we wanted to, to do this topic, um, and we, we got together on a little call and decided who we wanted to, to get on to, to sort of be our guest. There was only really one name that we came up with and we're, we're delighted that she agreed to give up some of her valuable time because she's clearly incredibly busy. And uh, Professor Cathy Bowen, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're really looking forward to it. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. <laughs> Just by way of really brief introduction, and as is, as is always the case with someone, guests of this level of, of experience and calibre, I can't, I can't hope to do their experience, their credentials justice, but uh, Cathy is uh, lead of the Foot and Ankle Research Programme down at Southampton University in the UK. She is chair of the research committee for the Royal College of Podiatry, and she is editor-in-chief for JFAR, the Journal of Foot and Ankle Research, amongst many other things. So more you know more than qualified to answer any questions you have so if you're watching live on facebook and you have any questions you've thought about dabbling in research or you're not things you're not sure about fire them into the comments craig will be keeping a watchful eye on them and he will chime in with them um as and when um but i thought what we do is start with some of the questions that had been emailed to me since i announced the episode uh, a few weeks back uh, i've had some emails and some messages um from i think some undergraduate students, some newly qualified people, just asking if we could go through um, a few things. So I've tried to organise them into a, into a logical order um, and kind of hopefully what will represent the timeline of you thinking about wanting to get something published and then the journey that it goes from that thought process through to when you're looking at, you know, a published article uh, with your name on it. Um, so maybe we could start, Cathy, if it's OK, with... Um, your thoughts on on why someone should be thinking about getting published what would you perceive the the benefits to be you know what what are the what are the good that can come through this process first thing the first good is for our field so so we you know, the, field, the field is quite nascent which means very embryonic still but an ankle research um and we we don't very much shout about what we do. So finding the evidence behind what we do and being able to promote that is, is a really, really good thing to do. And, and the, what, the best way to do it is to publish. So if you're doing something really good, find a way to publish your findings. Um, so that's, that's probably the, the first thing to do. Um, the other thing is, if, if you are doing research and you're funded to do research, then it is, it's up to you and, and you, it's your sort of moral obligation in a way to publish because all these participants that are coming in and they're taking part in your research they're not doing it for nothing they're doing it to try and benefit their care in the future so, so it is your obligation to publish as well i would say but those are probably my top two things as to why we should do it perfect um so just working my way down the list, the one, a common question I get asked, several people uh, message this to me and, and they said, I want to publish work. And these are people that I got the impression weren't necessarily currently involved in active research, a bit like the second comment you made there. But they, they're perhaps uh, in the NHS, perhaps in private practice, they, they, they got that feeling that they'd love to be involved, but they're not really sure what what they can publish because they, they're not working on any original research at, at the time. So what are the options for people who want to sort of go through this process, um, want to start working in this area, but perhaps aren't actively involved in research. What can people publish nowadays? There's a couple of ways. So in our profession, say podiatry, we've got the two journals that are associated with our professional bodies. So things to do with clinical practice, perhaps things that you've experienced, um, Stride magazine for the Australian Podiatry Association and the podiatrists. They're a really, really good vehicle get out there what you're doing and what's really good about what you're doing so those are a really good start to sort of dip your toe in the water if i'm allowed to sort of say that um the other way is to have journal clubs at work so if you're a clinician um you're in a you even if you're in a private practice on your own join up with other people um to have journal clubs and start reading articles so you get a feel for what is being published and how it's being published and, and there's so, you know, it varies so much from 
single case studies, you might have seen something really unusual that you think this would be really good for everyone to know. All the way through to occupations, occupations or through to randomized controlled trials, and you'll be part of a, a major research group. So, so there's a there's a whole continuum. Of what is really really good to get out there and publish? Yeah, it's really interesting. You say um, to consider, you know, like you say, um, the podiatrist. As it, I, I nearly called it podiatry now, then, and I, I, I had to stop myself. Yeah, I think its rebranding has been wonderful. It, it looks great. The, the the current committee, or you know, there are, are doing a grand job. Sorry, Craig, I can't speak to what the Australian one's like, but it's it's a lovely it's, start. It's, it's, it's pretty good, the Australian one. It's called yeah. Pride. And, um, and there's also Podiatry Today and Podiatry Management in the US. So, like, it, each country has its, say, magazine equivalent of a scientific yeah. journal. And even though they, they, they obviously feel like a softer a softer entry rather than going straight to, like, say, JFAR or JAPMA or the BJSM, there's still really similar processes that we're going to come on to talk about with regards to submission, peer review. So, um, yeah, it's a great it's a great place to start. Um, so... Just to sort of add there, I, uh, with the podiatrist, for example, one of the things I always say is it's read by... Well, it goes out to 15,000 people. You know, you think of all membership. So... You, you're guaranteed that what you're writing, if it gets published in that, all of our profession are reading it. Sometimes you might go to a journal that is a medical-based journal, and it may not get to the field unless people are signposted to it. So that it's always worth sort of remembering that too. Yeah, it's it's yeah, you're right. You you publish something, and you 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 immediately think, oh, I can't wait for everyone to read this, I'm under the assumption that everyone will, <laughs> or that pe that people will even see it. Um, and that's reminded me, I'll say, when we talk about getting feedback after, you know, once it's been published, I'll, I'll, I'll bring something up there. It will fit better there. Um, so let's, let's assume someone's decided, OK, I've got, I've got an idea. I've got a case study. I've got a, an editorial or a, or a clinical commentary. So not necessarily, like you say, a big bit of original research or an RCT, but they've got something they think will be of value that will contribute to the profession. And, and they're trying to decide where to put it. Um, we just talked about the, you know, the, the professional sort of journals, you know, the podiatrist, etc. What about when we look at the broader spectrum of journals out there? How, how does one decide where they're going to submit a paper to? You know, I had a question from from someone that said, is it all about impact factor? Uh, and then the sub question to that was, I'm not you know, in brackets. I'm not too sure. I didn't know. They didn't know what impact factor was. So is it all about impact factor? Is it more that the topic that you've chosen fits the fits the journal better? I mean, and is this something that before, you know, you should decide really, really early on? I think definitely decide early on when you're writing. But it, it, it isn't really all about impact factor. That, that impact factor sort of gives you a sense of the peer review process and the number of people that read it and cite the journal. And, and that means if, if you've got a number of articles that are produced by the journal, it's been cited X, Y, Z number of times. And that really is the impact factor. Um, so it, it's an algorithm that doesn't necessarily help when you're trying to choose your journal, because obviously the higher the impact factor you go, you're going up to the Lancet, you know, which, and then the top one is, is science and nature, you know, it's about 50. Um, you come down Lancet, so I think that's about, in about 40, 20, BMJ is about 10. JFAR, obviously my journal, Journal for Atlantic Research, where 2.4. So, and, and you, you look at the field and you look at, again, posture is above us about 2.6, below us, JAPMA, um, they're, I think they're just under, um, and then the foot is, is lower down. But you, you really should look at what's published in the journals um, and, and really look at, um, some may, may go towards more case studies, case based, some um, say like JAPMA, the American version is much more biomechanics. And then you've got Foot and Ankle International, which is surgical. Whereas our general Foot and Ankle research is really looking at trying to promote the research in the field. So very much you need to sort of gauge where the journal is um, and, and always look at the aims, you know, always look at the scope of the journal. And, and I would say that's one of the reasons why I reject things that come into me that... Um, there's a lot of surgical ones sometimes that don't fit our remit, but I'll send them over to Foot and Ankle International. You know, so you should advise other journals. Um, but it's amazing how many people just submit to us uh, without looking at our scope. 
Yeah. I'll, I'll look. I'll, I'll get a little plug plug in here for footwear okay. science as well. It, it okay. doesn't even have it. It doesn't have an impact factor because it's it's not. Um, the impact factor is only given out to X number of journals. So I'm on the editorial board and we're working for that. Yeah, but that's, that's a very niche journal, very specific topic. And there's some real pearls in, in that journal. But if you want to publish, it's got no impact factor. Um, so, you, you know, like, so it, it's it's yeah. a difficult. Um, but people will go to you. So people, yeah. people know you're going to look for footwear science. They will search yeah. your journal. And I think that's getting better these days. Yeah rather than yeah. everyone being too, you know, wrapped up with what the impact factor is. Yeah. They are trying to move away from that now, the journal. So so in the world, really that whole focus on impact factor <laughs> is, is changing to the narrative and sort of publishing the best place where you are going to get your article read rather than trying to go somewhere where it will never get read by the people you're aiming at. Yeah. So tip number one is clearly try and identify the journal fairly early on in this journey and make sure it's a journal that that suits you you know the aims and the scope of the journal fit what you're doing and also you know publishing in there will will, will achieve what you want to achieve as well because like you say gait and posture has a, a higher impact factor than jfar but straight away i know that something in jfar can be read by anyone because it's open access whereas there's straight away there's a hurdle to access gait and posture if you don't have access to it so um that's great to, to hear on, on that note and, and again talking about open journals and 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 you know open access journals and not um one question that came in is is it you know does it cost money to publish and i know this will be this will vary and it will be journal specific and i know that obviously at jfar we have opportunities to swerve round costs if depending if, on our memberships of things but could you just speak to perhaps the the people that have got are completely unaware that sometimes you have to pay your own money to publish in certain journals? It can come as quite a shock. So you, <laughs> you get your research ready, you, you submit, and then you get this bill um, for quite a few thousand pounds sometimes. Uh, and J JFAR is, we're, our, they're called article processing charges, and it's and it's how the manuscript is handled, and it's the pay the publisher really getting your paper up there up onto onto being in print or up as open access so you're paying a whole lot of backroom staff in the publishing in the publishing process to do that so ours is um, 1790 per manuscript that's pounds craig i'm really sorry i haven't converted that to australian dollars well. I'll have to just double it double it yeah <laughs> near yeah. enough <laughs> Yeah, so, so that, I mean, that's quite a lot of money for, for one paper. We're quite reasonable. And I think, I think for an international or higher, I think you go there, they're £2,400. Um, well, Rob, Rob's just commented that nature's $9,500, so I'm <laughs> presuming that might be US dollars. But, yeah, that's, um, yeah. It's, it's a lot. Yeah, you can, you, it's a lot of money to get published. Yeah. But you find that... Um, that's always worth checking out. So again, that might be your choice of journal when you're looking at where you want to go. Yeah, that's a bit tail wagging the dog, but it, it's. But, but I also, but I also assume in a lot of grant funded research, the publishing costs are built into your grant application. Well, assumably, yeah. Okay. Assumably, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes they are, and and sometimes they're not. It depends on the funder. Some some don't. The charities mm. in particular. Um, have separate pots of money for that. Um, mm. In the UK, the universities here also have separate subscriptions. So mm. I, could, I could talk, say, from Southampton University, where we are, we we have contracts with various publishers where you get a block contract. So we're able to then apply to the university to cover our publishing fees for certain journals and certain publishers. For for the Journal of Foot and Ankle Research, our two professional bodies will cover article processing charges, but it's on a managed process now. So you can apply to your professional body to ask for the fees to be covered, but there's certain criteria. So they're changing. Um, I think the priority now is early career researchers, the ones who are less likely to have put that in their grants. They might not have that covered in their grants, or they might not be attached to a university in the way that some of the, the leading researchers might be, they might have done that. 
I know, I know it is a it is a thought thorny issue, and you know, like Simon Spoon has just made a comment ridiculous that you even have to pay. Um, yeah. You know, but, you know, it is a hot topic, and we could probably argue that for quite some time. Yeah. Well, at this point, we should probably mention predatory journals, um, just in case people aren't aware of them, because I think the first red flag is if you ever get an email from a journal. In a journal emails you asking for you to submit that's a red flag that they're probably predatory but um kathy do you mind just explain to people what what predatory journals are and how we could possibly spot them and why we should avoid them because i read a really, really interesting blog earlier when i was doing I do, I do do a little bit of research for this i don't know i know it doesn't look like it and um i read a blog where someone put forward a case that uh, el savia technically could be classified as predatory given how much it values making money over translating research which i think was just someone i think trying to be intentionally inflammatory but could you just speak to what predatory journals are for those that may have not heard of them before yeah there's a number all these journals that have come on the market now and they they, they charge but they, they don't charge as much but they what they don't have is a peer review process so whereas those that are charging and the article processing charges of this one, they go through an international peer review process usually and and it's that that keeps the robustness of the articles and, and the robustness I, of what's out there I think, I, but kathy i'm pretty sure they claim they do have a peer review process but we all know it's probably fake <laughs> um, yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and that and it's, they're really hard to spot the predatory journals um they 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 come through it says hugely if you're if you're solicited to try and publish like we want you to publish in here um, and, and the best thing to do is just check out the website of that journal um, and just see what all their processing um, charges are, see, see what the processes are, look at the editors in chief that are, are, are you know, part of that journal, look at the editorial team, the editorial board, who is on it, and, you, and you'll see, you'll be able to gauge whether or not they're a predatory journal. But it's yeah, really I've, hard to spot. Yeah, I've been tracking five foot related predatory journals a couple of defunct now but there's still a few out there yeah and I, I, you know again i don't particularly like them i agree with all your issues but sadly if you actually browse some of them there are a couple of pearls in some of them yeah. that are actually yeah. worth reading and that's mm -hmm. like you just sort of yeah it's, it's a difficult one um mm -hmm. yeah it may not have been peer reviewed but when you have a read of it there, is, there are some snippets of good information and occasionally um, yeah. i think that's your 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 way of you self-reviewing aren't you so you're yeah. you're the last thing as the peer yeah. reviewer and i think as long as you you know you have that in mind oh, that yeah. you've gone through that process so when you're reading it you're reading it with an informed opinion you know view from that pro from the process oh, yeah. well i'm only only reading them because i track what they're publishing and what they're doing and you know because like i said there are there are five of them that i sort of periodically monitor um and you know they, they're like i said there's three that are still publishing infrequently um but usually from you, you can tell that it, it's what they publish would never make it into jfr or something another one of the more prestigious journals um but that doesn't mean they don't have a little bit of little bit of value in them <laughs> i mean there used to be a an online sort of almost a repository for a list of the predatory journals it was called beals list, Beals um, list yeah. but unfortunately it got discontinued in 2017 but yeah so just so people are aware of them they're out there um and be mindful of them um going back to our our, our timeline so we decided we're going to publish something we think we've got a good idea we've identified the journal that we think would be a good fit for us and 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 they'd be you know be a good fit in a in bi-directional way um We've decided, we've seen how much it costs. We've put aside the, rel the relevant funds. We're good to go. Let's talk about the thorny, potentially thorny issue of ethical approval. Um, two, two kind of sub discussions here. The first, I guess, from your perspective, Kathy, is, is the, the frustrations you must get uh, from an editorial board perspective. And I know having spoken to a few people who are in these similar positions of, of things that get submitted that don't have ethical approval. Um, so perhaps we could speak to what needs ethical approval does everything submitted to jfar for example need it or do some things not and and then after that we'll talk about how how we access ethical approval particularly if we're not attached to a university because i've got several people asking me i'm in private practice i've got i'm, I'm collecting data 
but I just, I just, I can't publish it anywhere other than my own blog because mm. I can't get ethical approval. So yeah, perhaps we could do that. I mean, there's two questions there, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, ethical approval, absolutely. We will not publish without it. Um, th th there's a governance statement, um, all, of, all of BMC Publishing, I say all the main publishing companies will now ask you to declare um, everything so you have to declare any conflicts of interest you have to declare your governance you have to declare your your um, ethics approval but not just saying i have ethics approval you have to give your reference numbers so it can be checked so so um because we have had quite a few that used to come through um that said they had ethics approval and then it turned out they didn't really and, and that's those were ones that have rejected of course when they go through so only checks and the process is usually checked for that anything any research you do on humans and human participants should have some level of ethical approval so the only things that we don't um, say are things like systematic reviews narrative reviews so things like that um those are the ones that you know you can have a waiver in that disclosure statement everything else has to have a statement to either say that they have gone to an ethics committee and checked and they have a letter to say that um, the ethics committee have looked at the proposal and have decided you don't need to go for the full approval on this um, you don't need it those could be things like service evaluations but you still need permission to do the service evaluation so you still need that sort of that agreement and that level of governance to say that you had the permission to go to that data set, analyze the data set and publish it. So, so it's almost like you've got to sort of think, everything that involves human participants, I have to have something that I declare, that I have checked this out. And, and that extends to, I know I was just talking to one of your colleagues about this uh, a few weeks back, that extends to server, you know, because it used to be, if I'm doing something to a human, it makes obvious sense if I'm touching a human, injecting a human, it needs ethics, you know, to show, to protect them. But surveys where we haven't, you know, even particularly during COVID, a lot of surveys were, were remote. So we weren't even in the same room as this human, but we have asked them some questions and they have sent us the answers. These require ethical approval. They do, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. or oh, they require you to have made that attempt to check whether or not you need it. And then you have to have, the declaration to say, actually, our local ethics committee needs to review this. I don't need to go for approval. So we, we always need that statement. Perfect. Yeah. So, next question: How do we get it? What does what does that what does that look like? Yeah, I, I, I've had this question so much, particularly from people in private practice. Um, and, and the best we we can try in um, the research committee. College of Dietary to solve this one. The only way is to pair up, is, is to find um, usually the local NHS hospitals, they'll all have ethics committees and governance committees, and the universities will all have committees. And, and it's and most people are approachable, especially in our field. Um, go to the, your local university and ask for support to do that. Because then you've obviously got something that you want to publish and something that's really good. So why wouldn't we want to help? Um, I, th I think it's that stage of, of that process that is not obvious in our professions at the moment. Yeah. So if someone was in private practice on the South Coast and they were sitting on some something they've been working on and they, they've done all the aforementioned steps, but they, they were listening to this thinking, oh, I didn't realise I needed ethical approval for a survey. They could reach out to, to the University of Southampton and and potentially, you know, have that kind of ratified. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, they could reach out. Any of the team at Southampton contact any of, of the podiatry academic team. Um, and, and they would always have, and I can say that for all the other institutions too. So there yeah. was a conversation across at the, college, at the Royal College as well. Um, there's no other way. Yeah. And last, <laughs> yeah. last question on this, just in case people have been working on things, you know, recent years have been strange. So people may have had more time to work on manuscripts and, 
and perhaps they've gone through this process and now they've realised they need ethical approval. Can it be, can it be provided retrospectively? Mm -hmm. That's a really tricky one because it's going to depend what it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, Great reading. I, okay, I, I spent many, many years on the University Ethics Committee. Um, generally, the answer is maybe. <laughs> that, that, you, you know, we have given retrospective. I mean, the typical example would be someone who has collected a lot of data on patients in their clinical practice, and oh, hey, I can use that data for a research project. Well, generally, you need approval in advance to collect data from someone. So that's that's probably going to get approved with, with you know they, they want to know what consent forms were signed all that kind of information so so yeah it's, it's, there's no blanket one way or the other um it has ha, has been given um, i've certainly been involved in some of those and it hasn't been given in others and i've again been involved in some of those as well yeah perfect so the bottom line is you won't get published if you haven't got it. Right, so you've got to you've got to try it, right, um, and see you know, see yeah. how you go. Um, Craig, any questions on ethics before we move on? Because I just know it was one of the things I got emailed about the most, so I didn't know if there was any comments. No, I, I, I put um, I, I put one up, but there was a Simon Spooner actually made a comment about um, the pairing up issue about the um, universities require funding. Yeah, you know, so that, that that you need a like almost a research collaborator from the university to work with you on this. Um, is the line manager of that particular person going to be happy for them working on a project that's not bringing in funding? So that there there are issues around that. Um, I'm not saying it's not that's not a reason not for it to happen, um, but it, it may uh, come up. Yeah, I have the, there's um there's organisations like the Royal College has got the, the mentorship now for things like for pairing people up um CAPA is the council for allied health professions research again they're they're there to support these are for the uk sorry so i'm not sure what the equivalent is in australia but, yeah. but we have these organizations that are there to support research and i'm particularly yeah. getting people off the ground with their research and all of these things that you don't know when you start that, that these are the sort of things you need to do until your teeth yeah. are down the line Sure. Actually, just got an interesting comment from Michelle in New Zealand. Um, hey, Michelle, um, they have a national ethics committee, so that would that would cover anyone in private practice, anyone you know, anyone in the university setting. Um, unfortunately, in Australia, we have the NHMRC, which is the overall arching body, but they sort of delegate ethics responsibility to all the universities, so which have their ethics committees. So, unfortunately, that's where you have to go. <laughs> um, there isn't like a national ethics committee. Um, I, presume I mean, New Zealand's a bit smaller so I presume that kind of um, situation or having a national committee that anyone could access it would be much better yeah mm. perfect so we've we've come up with our idea we've decided we've got the funds we've identified the journal we've we've secured ethics or we've moved to New Zealand one or the other you know we've, we've got that <laughs> side done um, one of the things before we talk about peer review one of the things I think it it was so important that we mentioned about identifying the journal early is that when you go onto each of the journal websites there's a little link somewhere where it says something like um you know information for authors or you know it, it's fascinating to me just how different the the house rules are if that's the right thing to call them so um kathy let me ask you as an editor if if someone submitted to you and it and, and you know you've got clear instructions about how you want it formatted and spaced and set out etc and, and many many other things if that at first glance almost immediately hasn't been adhered to that's got to be almost grounds for immediate sending back to them right yeah i do so right. so they all come so so there's myself and there's um, professor keith rome too with the two so i'm going to talk from j5.3 the two editors and keith all manuscripts come through us so we share the load so we probably had last year we we had just under 250 manuscripts come through that we have to process so so we're the ones that are the first sifting so imagine i we do this voluntary you know and and this is it, it's on you know with our other jobs too so with that amount of manuscripts 
if it's not formatted, if it's not got ethics, if it's not in our scope, we send them straight back so they are rejected without even going to peer review. Yeah. So, so it's really, really important that you look at our submission guidelines, even down to the format in the heading hierarchy that we have. Yeah, yeah I got makes... taught, I got taught that a long, long time ago. Follow the guidelines. Yeah, yeah don't well, like, you know. I was taught give yourself a chance. Like, don't don't get don't fall at the first hurdle because you didn't because yeah. you didn't follow guidelines that were there. My my wife works in HR, and she, you know, for any given job at any time, they they get a hundred CVs, and they can't interview a hundred people, so they have to whittle down a hundred to say. 15 or 20 so at the first pass anything with a, a spelling mistake or a typo just gets put in the reject pile and yeah. it's kind of a similar process isn't it but the volume you're seeing you you just can't take the time and the energy to process all of them so as as someone submitting give yourself a chance of getting over that first hurdle whatever journal you've chosen go to that website look at the submission guidelines and just follow them to a t uh, just to get over that first hurdle um so it comes, just to give people insight, once they've gone through all the process of ethics and they've paid their money and they've followed the guidelines and they feel they've got a really good idea and then they submit it to you, obviously then it's like the wizard behind the curtain. We just sit back and we're, we're in no man's land. We don't know what's going on. Could you give us an insight into then what happens to our paper once it arrives on your desk? So once, once I've decided that it fits our scope, it's something that we, we will be really interested in. Then I send it to a associate editor. So we have three associate editors in Australia and three associate editors in the UK. So we've got Kylie Williams, we've got Andrew Bolt, Campanano in Australia, and Gordon Hendry, Stuart Morrison, and Sarah Curran in the UK. So, so we send all of them to them and they become the handling editor. And, and obviously Keith and I will keep them too. We tend to keep the more tricky ones, Keith and me. Um, but then we, we send them we send them to them and then then it's their job they do another sifting so then they they will review it in a little bit more depth than Keith and I have at first glance in that sifting and then they make another decision on to whether it will go for peer review so there's another layer in that process and at that point they might pick something up that we didn't in the first so it could get rejected then even before, and that, that's before peer review. If they've gone through it and they're they're happy with the manuscript, they will then invite their reviewers. So in JFAR, we have um, a selection criteria. So we have a list of people that is kept on the system of everybody that's registered in JFAR, everybody that's published. Um, we have a list of reviewers um, that we can access. So they, if you put keywords in categories when you submit your paper. Um, we will look for those categories in our peer reviewers. Also, because we know the field, we're like, we can go down the list and we can find people in the list according to the category. Um, but it doesn't really stop there because our peer reviewers may also may be reviewing. So the system tells us who's already got one to review. And that's the thing I find the most tricky is in a field that's quite small, we want three reviewers per manuscript. If you just have one, you just get a, you just that's one opinion. Two, you may get polarized opinions. So three reviewers is our ideal, but you can imagine trying to find three reviewers and all on two hundred manuscripts. You know, is it, quite onerous in that. But usually, you know, our field is really good. So our handling editors send the papers out for peer review. They, they're given, we allow in the system 14 days, or I, I sometimes put it up to 21, depending on how I think people are at the time. You know, through COVID, we've been extending the peer review process. So 21 days to 28 days, we've been allowing reviewers um, to, to spend on the papers. Yeah, but I, I, it's probably worth pointing out that, you know, that the role of the editors and the role of peer reviews is all voluntary. Yes. Um, which means they are a limited resource. <laughs> um, yeah. It's not an unlimited pool of their people. Which, um, and I, I, I think pretty much every review I do is probably done late. 
Um, and that's just great. You know, everything you, know, you, you do in life, everything you oh, do. In well, life yeah, that's a point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like you just, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a limited resource, and and it, 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 I know it's a, it's a, it's a challenge for reviewers to do it in their in their workloads. It's a challenge for editors to find reviewers that are that are going to step up and help out. Um, but yeah, you know, if you're publishing, you you have a, a moral and ethical responsibility to participate in the review process of other publications, and that's. Um, actually, and that which brings me to this point, Rob's just brought up a point I was going to make. It's time to start paying reviewers. Um, and I know there's been plenty of debates and blog posts and commentary on, on that going on for quite some time. But if that's going to happen, the fees to publish are going to have to go up. Yeah, and they, they've gone up quite a bit already. Yeah. Um, yeah, we talked. We talked. We've talked about actually giving tokens back to mm -hmm. stellar reviewers. So we have. We have. We also know who's reviewed and who hasn't over the year. Yeah. So we get a report. A report from our publisher on um on who's done the most reviews and you know. So we can thank people who've done exceptional things mm -hmm. for us. And we we've asked BMC if there is any possibility of yeah. giving back or allowing people a, a waiver for their next for an article um, next time. Um, I, I know some journals do have incentives. Like I recently did a review for a journal that um, I got free access for one month to Science Direct. Um, and as I'm not at a university, that was quite handy. But if you're already at a university, <laughs> you already got it. But, you, you know, there are they're, they're trying to give some incentives here. So... As the person who's, you know, in this in this um, pseudo story who submitted the paper, all of this is going on, and we're sitting there. How much time, you know, we 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 we. What's the first we know? You know, I think I know the answer to this, but you know, like, at what point do do we get contacted, and 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 sort of informed as to what's going on? What sort of timelines should people be uh, mentally expecting to to hear? Yeah. So allow about a month for the for the first peer review. So, so we're looking at getting three reviewers' comments back within four to six weeks. And our handling editors, once they've got those peer review comments, they read through the comments and they will make a decision based on what the reviewers have said to them. And the reviewers get um, a, a selection. So they can either say, reject the paper. They can say, um, the paper is, is quite a good paper, but it, it needs quite a lot of work. So it's major revision. Or they could say, well, actually, the paper is quite good. Um, but there's a couple of comments that I have that, you, you know, they, they may want to clarify for the readers. So those are minor revisions. It's really rare it goes through just straight as it is. So, that's it. so it's likely you'll have one of those three. So our editor will then send the manuscript back to you with those reviewer comments. And then it's up to you how you respond to them. So. We, we give you a timeline, so we'll give you, a, we'll usually give you um, four weeks to respond to those comments. You can ask for longer if you need it, if it's major revision, and we can be quite flexible with that. But when you get the comments, they are people in the field that have given their opinions to you. So you don't have to change your paper to every single comment. You can, you, we just want you to respond to the comments, and, and more often than not, Authors will say, well, actually, yeah, I get that. That's what the review, yeah, okay, the review is not understanding what I've said here. So, okay, I'll change that, I'll rephrase it. And that's usually what happens. Um, and we ask for a point-by-point -point response. And that's another one. If you don't give a point-by-point -point response, we'll just send it straight back to you. Because <laughs> it's really hard to see, well, if you've changed your manuscript, how do we know how you've responded to the reviewers? And I, I think the key thing to perhaps mentally prepare people for, or to set expectation for when you're submitting some work, is that, um, you know, you've worked on this. You, It's clearly in your mind a good idea. You've poured time and energy and love and sweat and, and money into it by this point. And obviously you and your, your entire board are obviously utterly lovely humans, but you, you are honest about, you know, giving feedback. And... Sometimes that hurts, you know, a, a straight rejection or even comments that, that perhaps conflict how you feel about your own paper. Uh, the, for the first time you get that, it's, it's, it's a strange experience. So do you have any tips with 
how people should deal with that. The first thing I was always told was whatever comments you get, just read them and then do not do anything for 48 hours. Just, you know, it's a bit like don't, don't, don't write angry kind of thing. Um, you know, show it to a friend or a colleague or a peer who you trust. Get, get a third pair of eyes. Have you got any tips for, I guess, how to deal with feedback and how to try and take it as a positive and a learning experience and not feel because it's never personal of course but it can feel that way yeah it, it shouldn't it shouldn't be personal and of course it's personal back because the reviewers are giving their opinion and and definitely take a step back take a breath <laughs> take a step back it, you know it, it happens it's, you can know it's happened to all of us i've had some really great ones in the past um but you just you know you step back and you have to reflect and you think well they they're reading it through a lens and I'm obviously not explaining myself well enough because they're asking this question. So you, you sort of have to take a step back and think, well, can I rephrase it? Um, if it's an outright reject, that's, that's quite tricky. But then you, you have to sort of take a step back and reflect, you, you know, was I in the scope? You know, was it the scope of the journal? Did I fit the scope? Usually you'll get comments as to why it's rejected. Um, and it just may be that it's it's not pushing the field forward. You know, once it's gone through peer review, if we get comments back to say, well, this isn't actually adding any new knowledge to the field, that that can be just the basis for a reject. It might be really new to you, and it might be new to your practice, but not new to the whole field. So it doesn't push any boundaries. So that, that could be a reason. But again, don't, yeah, don't take it personally. Um, because you, it, it is all, all feedback, everyone says, all feedback is supposed to be good feedback. But I know there are just those minor ones that just aren't. And, and in that case, just walk away and go somewhere else. Pick, send your manuscript somewhere else. Um, and traditionally, it was always reviewer two, wasn't it? In the two reviewer model, there was that old adage of like, reviewer yeah. one was lovely and reviewer two was, mm -hmm. was an absolute uh, terror to you now obviously i don't know how that works with your three review uh, uh sort of model do you still get <laughs> is it two good and one bad cop or you good review a three <laughs> <laughs> review a three is the bad one <laughs> yeah you got to have some good cop bad cops so um timeline wise I, when i was on jfr website earlier I was, I, was, I was amazed to see that from on average from submission from the day you've sort of not all the work you've done but the day you sort of hit submit on the on the website to, to acceptance um, on average was, was I think 98 days. Obviously a rejection comes a bit uh, a bit quicker than that often. Um, and then from acceptance to publication is another 15 days. So I make that from the day you hit submit on JFAR to the day you're looking at it on the JFAR website, just, just under four months, which yeah. I think is incredible um, compared to some of the timelines that many of us, I think, have had to wait on, you know, in, in recent or previous years. Um, is that typical of of online open access journals like JFAR? Or is that a JFAR thing? We work really hard on that. So, so it, it's something that we are measured against. So when people are choosing the journal, and, what, and it absolutely comes back to your early question, which journal to choose, if you want something published quicker, that is the type of information you want to be looking at. But because there's eight of us that are handling these manuscripts, um, we, we do um, spread them around so that the workload isn't too onerous on one particular editor. And we work really hard. And, and the team are just amazing. You know, just that we've, we have got an amazing group of associate editors who handle these manuscripts. And, and we've also got in the, the back room of the publishing house the automated generated uh, reminders for our peer reviewers. Um, but it also says a lot about our peer reviewers in the field. You know, crazy. it is really hard to get hold of peer reviewers. Um, but, but I think because we all want to support our field, we, we have got a really good group of people that are there, you know, really trying to will the field on and help us progress and publish as we've got. So, I think there's quite a number of things that come together to, to make that happen. And you wouldn't get that in a lot of the other journals. Yeah. Actually, interesting, just on the, the politics of um, how fast it is to get published, is obviously with the COVID-19 pandemic, there's been pressure to get COVID-related research published quicker and sooner. So a lot of research is going on preprint servers before peer review. 
And while we were talking, I've just checked Retraction Watch, and they are up to 207 COVID-19 papers, relate, related papers that have been retracted Gosh. because they were they were presumably rushed through that peer review process to get the information out there. So there's not necessarily anything wrong with a slow process. Um, you know, 207 retractions is a, is a lot. Um, you know, that's research that got out there and presumably cited and used before the problems were noted. The other thing I think we should probably flag for, for people regarding peer review that they may not be aware of is sometimes it's blinded and sometimes it isn't. So, you know, if you send a paper in, uh, the person reviewing it may or may not know your name. You know, certainly I've peer reviewed things where I don't know even what country it's from. Um, and likewise, you know, it, it works two ways in that when you're reviewing, you, you're often as a reviewer reviewing and you know you're anonymous versus not being anonymous. Now, I know that JFAR, I, I don't know how recent it's been, but I've certainly noticed more recently on the website, not only is it very open and transparent peer review process, you can go onto any recent paper, even as a, you know, we could go onto the website now and you could pull up the, the sort of peer reviews and read them. And I've certainly said to people that have, you know, students who've said, oh, peer review scares me. I was like, well, why don't you go and read, you know, someone, read as a third person, someone else, look at the, the first draft, the peer review, the comments, the, it really allows you to almost be a fly on the wall of peer review before you put yourself through it. Um, what are your thoughts very briefly, Cathy, on, which is preferable, being completely open and transparent. This person wrote the paper and, and I'm going to put my name to reviewing it versus everyone's anonymous. Um, I get the feeling like comments might be less less mean if you're not anonymous. Is that an unreasonable sort of uh, interpretation? No, I think you're right. I, I, I definitely prefer that system though, the transparent one. Uh, because because it has open dialogue and you, and you get academic debate, you get scientific debate through those comments. And, and it's and it is less confrontational as well when, it, when it's closed and you don't see all that process that's gone beforehand um it, it, it yeah you don't know how much the work has changed or how much that public that peer review opinion has changed the thinking in the paper whereas when you when it when you can see the comments you can see how it has actually enhanced the readability of the paper because that's usually what the problem is um it's very great Back yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Kathy. I, I much prefer that process. But the counter argument is that um, if you you know you know who the author is, you may consider them a rival of yours, and re, and, and so you may be harsher, or you may be trying to yeah. not get them published, or you may and I, I I may be guilty of this myself. You you. You know the author. Oh, he's a he, he's a good bloke. You know he's done some good research before. So you might be less harsh in your review because you know who it is. Um, so I'm not saying I, I agree with your view. I'd rather it was open. But the I, I do get the arguments for why it should be blinded to, to not bias against the, the, the who the research group may be or may not be. Yeah, there's definitely a halo effect with mm. that. What yeah. we try and do though, that and, and that's where. Um, we do we do the hierarchy of the editors in, in terms of handling that. So so that the editors then have that that decision. So when you get yeah. reviewers and you, you know that just because we know the field, you know, it's such a small field, we're always gonna know who they're publishing. But you, you can you can now I would say probably Keith and I have got a good handle. You can mm. see when that sort of thing is happening, which is why the three reviews then sort of counterbalance. Mm. And, and yeah. All of our editors, we know, we know what's a good thing that's going through now, I'd mm. say. Um, yeah. And so when, that's, that's so when you're picking your journal, check the editorial board, check none of your none of your enemies on the editorial board, <laughs> and, 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 you know, you're good to go. You, um, you, the, cannot, well, you, can, you cannot, when you submit your paper, you can yeah. write, you can tick a box and say, I don't want X, Y, and Z to be reviewers. And and that's okay. We respect that too. And that that you yeah. you can have that say. Yeah, but, but the, the other yeah. the other point is, in, in, in a reasonably small field, and you get something to review anonymous, you probably can work out who it is anyway. Um, and, and I know on a number of times, and I, I think Simon's just made a comment. You know, he finds it easier to review, and I don't know who I'm reviewing. You know, I, I can take that point too. Yeah. So. 
where we how are we doing for time we're about to wrap up so let's talk about um being rejected never a good thing in life um <laughs> whether we're talking about being being published or otherwise but you know rejections happen and like I say sometimes we get comments and we we modify them and then it gets accepted sometimes we get straight rejections or rejections uh, do you want to try and put a positive spin on why that i don't want that i would hate for that to put off our our young you know next generation our early our early career researchers i'd hate the idea of someone feeling like they were being marked and then that was it was gonna you know make them upset um could we talk about how rejection can be a really positive and i've certainly found that just the process of submitting work and i've had almost as much rejected as i've had published but just the process every single time has been valuable i've learned something i've now got an appreciation of the process that colors the way i read other researchers work and and how i try to be respectful when i offer appraisals or criticisms or peer reviews of my own um could we just talk about you know how even rejection can be positive and how that shouldn't be something that puts people off well yeah because people have still gone out of their way to read your manuscript you know people people have still gone out of their way to comment and the fact that they've comment usually will ignore the ones who are like the third reviewer and like the, just ignore those ones <laughs> we're allowed to do that um but the ones that have given you feedback it usually is constructive and it, and it usually is actually this won't hit the bar because of this or it's the methodology or it's something in it that needs to change um to hit the bar in that particular journal so so that that's always something to work on you know so feedback is always good whatever it is um the thing you said about being a peer reviewer as well you you learn and, and i'm like you i would i i like to write as a peer reviewer how i want to receive feedback as well and, and i think that's the one thing to always think about particularly when we're trying to grow our fields is how would you like to receive it you know and and you want it to be constructive to try and help you and, and particularly if you are a new researcher and you're trying to make your way um having those experts in the field tell you what to do is actually brilliant if you really think about it you know how often would you get that opportunity yeah yeah i think when you see someone usually on social media because it it can be a rather toxic place but i think when you see someone on social media twitter suddenly sort of just publish you know put a link to a, a new paper and say this is a pile of garbage. I think what that speaks to is that that's probably a person that that hasn't submitted research ever themselves before. Because I think if you <laughs> had been through that entire, you know, long and tiresome and, and you know energy draining process, I just don't feel like you would necessarily speak like that about even if you disagreed with it uh, at its basic most basic level. It's it's potentially a year or two of someone else's life that you've yeah. just said is hot garbage. And it, I think that is also a flag for you know um someone who probably isn't ingra ingrained in the process either so i i i i'd love for someone who was listening particularly an undergrad or a new grad to just go on to, even if this wasn't on their radar of something they wanted to do would be to go onto the j file website tonight look at some of the most recent papers but rather than just still looking at the papers look at look at the peer review process click on that link that shows you the peer reviews and then go up to the top and look at you know submission uh, guidelines for authors and just have a look at even if you're not even thinking about doing it just get a feel for what we're talking about because i, I feel like it might get some juices flowing that pe perhaps people didn't know they had um that's my hope of, of this kind of episode anyway i would love that <laughs> <laughs> no what i don't want to do is double your your 250 to 500 when you know and they're all desk rejections straight away but at the same time you know it's a good process for people um, just to wrap up because we're, we're coming to a close do you have any, uh, I think we've gone through many, many top tips. So maybe we should sign off by talking about resources where that you would signpost for people, whether they be podcasts or, or blogs or, or, or journal articles or books. Like where, where would you guide someone towards who wanted to know more, um, you know, a more formal version of all the things we've discussed this evening? There, there's so many resources available now for writing. Um, even even in, in JFAR, we in the BMC publishing in the house, there's a whole site full of information about how to publish, how to write your paper, how to abstract it. Um, and and the, the, the professional bodies both have done a lot of work on that. And I know because I've been involved and I know the RMG committee is on both sides of the 
globe have been involved in, in doing those top tips. Um, if, and if you look back over the years of the podiatry sort of guide, you'll find those articles, you'll find all the things about the ethics that we've talked about, how to write the publication, um, how to look for funding, um, who, you know, how to, how do I even find a mentor, you know, to help me? Um, and, and both professional bodies will have mentorships. I'm talking to those podiatrists in a few countries, but there are mentors across the globe too um, in the field. And I would probably say find yourself a good mentor. Um, me mentors are there to try and promote the field and they want to do good and bring on the next generation. Um, and that, that would be probably the best thing you could do, especially yeah. if you're new into it. Super. Craig, anything else to add from Facebook? No, we've, we've, we've kept up the comments as we're going along, which is really good. But I've just had one thing to, to what Cathy said. My favourite website, sort of related to all this, is Retraction Watch. Um, I, I get their feed and, and I, I just love reading them, especially the comments on their articles. And, you know, for those not familiar with it, these are when something gets published and then later on something is found to be wrong so the journal retracts the publication so this this website retraction watch um monitors that and, and it's just fascinating some of the behind the scenes going on and those kinds of issues and how quick some journals act how slow i don't think jfar has not had a retraction retract no. anything has it no, no yeah. We have not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there was there was a systematic review on helix limitus that did appear on retraction watch that got retracted but it didn't really go into details to what was wrong with it so there's obviously something fishy behind the scenes you know um, oh, i'm gonna have a look at that tomorrow <laughs> yeah. okay well i think we're, we're all done so thanks everyone oh, just got one one comment but rob's been making a lot of comments all the way through so any final comments perhaps on students wanting to publish their theses so you got any tips there kathy um, it, it's always is don't do it on your own you know work with the, your supervisors who've been working with you on it um you know i would say it's rare you get a single author publication these days there's usually a whole team of people and the supervisors will want to support you through it too so really make sure you work with them um to get that done yeah Okay, well, thanks very much. The, the, the hour's gone very, very quickly. Thanks for all the comments. Um, thanks for we had quite a few people listening this time, which was good. Um, if you've just joined us, come back in half an hour. The video will be rendered by Facebook and be available. I'll have this up on YouTube in a few hours um, if something doesn't get in my way, which often does happen. So, look, thanks very much, Kathy. Well, thank thanks. thanks so much, Kathy. Thanks very much.